Hi, I'm Dr Erin O'Brien from the School of Justice in the Faculty of Law at the Queensland University of Technology. I'm joined today by my colleague Dr Helen Berentz to talk about her new book, Young People and Everyday Peace, Exclusion, Insecurity and Peace Building in Colombia. Helen, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. So Helen, what is your book about? So my book centrally takes young people's experiences of and understandings of, of peace and of conflict um, as a starting point to think about um, more representative ways of, of, of thinking about peace building. And so it responds then to the, the, the tendency to flatten or to overlook um, what goes on at, at the local everyday level. Um, and to do that, it situates itself in a, in a community in Colombia um, that is um, largely a, a population of internally displaced uh, people and um, takes young people's stories and experiences of living in that environment as, as the basis for, for thinking about the, about the book. Okay, y you focus attention on the everyday, mm -hmm. it's even in the title of the book. Can you tell me, what do you mean by the everyday in relation to peace building? Sure, so there's been growing attention to this idea of the everyday in uh, peace and conflict studies and international relations generally, um, the local, the hybrid, you know, these other ways of thinking about peace that respond to um, uh, an absence of attention on, on these spaces and over um, attending to institutions and things. And um, a lot of this work is, is really great. It's uncovering a lot of different sites and experiences of, of, of peace and of conflict. But I think that um, it often overlooks um, the the experiences that go on in the, at the very local everyday level and of people who are, are marginalised in those kind of discourses. So I use uh, feminist theory, in particular feminist embodiment theory, to try and better account for those bodies that move through and navigate and, and respond to violence in their in their lives and who work to to collectively build peace. So I'm thinking here uh, about extending that idea of the everyday to talk about it as embodied and talk about it as um, as lived and experienced amidst violence. Of course. Uh, I love the way you take young people's lives and experiences so seriously in the book. You know, they're very central to the stories and the way the arguments unfold. Why do you think it's so important to look at young people when you're talking about peace building? Well, young people are disproportionately affected by conflict and violence around the world um, and yet when we go to, to theorise and to debate and, and discuss and respond to, to conflict and violence, they are often absent from our thinking. So young people make up almost two billion um, people in the world, you know, a third of them have been directly affected by conflict and, and that number is bigger um, in indirect um, effects and yet we don't account for them, right? They, they experience these things in, in multiple ways. They, in, they engage and involve themselves in their, in their communities. And it's a real oversight that, that we're not engaging with them. And so this work is part of a growing um, a group of scholars that are working in this space, trying to think about young people's agency, to take young people's knowledge and experience as a, as a valid site of, of, of understanding about these, about these things. Your book specifically focuses on Colombia and the conflict there that's lasted you know, more than half a century. Uh, you know, as we know, there has been a peace process recently and a peace agreement. Uh, but as your book shows, you know, conflict is not simple uh, and it can have profound and lasting consequences on people's lives. Why did you choose to look at Colombia for your research? Colombia is a, a really interesting uh, case. Um, when we think about peace and conflict, it's often not included when we talk about um, you know, the, the conflicts that dominate analyses. And yet, it has been this incredibly long-running conflict that presents a whole bunch of really important questions for us to think about. What does it mean for conflict that has endured for multiple generations, that has impacted you know, almost literally everyone in the country in, in different ways, um, an enormous volume of internally displaced uh, people, refugees, hundreds of thousands of people killed, tens of thousands of people disappeared. You know these kind of these kind of impacts that uh, are long-lasting and and impact people's everyday lives, right? So even when a peace process happens and these you know there's an institutional kind of effort um, to respond to it, the violence doesn't doesn't stop in people's lives. Right? So since the peace process, there have been more human rights defenders killed you know, in the last year yeah. um, than, you know, the years before the, before the peace process. So I think it asks us to think more carefully about these questions of what does attempts to build peace look like in midst of protracted conflict and amidst of violence that is ongoing even after, say, the formal end of conflict as well. 
Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, obviously, you, you did your field work uh, mm -hmm. in Colombia. Can you tell me a little bit about where you did the research and the young people that you met there? Sure. I worked in a um, informal, a legal um, community uh, on the outskirts of, of Colombia's capital, Bogota, actually in the in the neighbouring um, city of Soacha. Um, and this community has been there for, for um, decades. So, again, intergenerational experiences of these places. Um, it is... Uh, it was established as an illegal settlement. They're gradually gaining their rights. Um, it's uh, profoundly affected by gang violence, um, by the absence of state support and, and services. Um, and it is, is a very young population. So these young people face a whole lot of uh, intersecting and complicated risks and violences in their everyday life. And yet they work as part of the community to respond. So I worked through a, a foundation and a school in that space and I um, spent uh, four months in 2010 and then I returned in 2016 to, to talk to them again um, about their experience, their everyday experiences, their opinions of, of the government and their, their um, hopes and, and thoughts about the future and things as well. So, Is there a particular story uh, that you feel exemplifies the role of young people in peace building? I think it's really, it's hard to pull one story out of, sure. of these in part because the, the point is is that it's it's these small things that happen in, in their everyday lives, whether that's violence or you know efforts towards peace that that are important to pay attention to. Um, so whether that's um, one young woman telling me about choosing different paths to school in the morning depending on you know the news that, that uh, is in her neighborhood about which way is safer to walk um, in terms of you know responding at an everyday level to, to these kinds of violences through to young people participating and involving themselves in uh, community groups and um, uh, those kind of things advocating for you know better services for the community um, or the community coming together so there's a great uh, example that uh, a 15 year old uh, young woman gave me about um, the the community buying light bulbs to replace the street lights that had blown that the government wouldn't fix because that's incredibly important you know it's not very safe after after dark but having those lights makes it that little bit safer for the for the community and so the community coming together to respond to that absence and you know so all those small things that they do um, coming together in this way to to respond to violence and to build peace well that's a, that's a wonderful story and it's just one of many that are that are in the book what are you hoping that people will take away from this book what what do you feel is the lasting significance of this work um, I hope that it contributes in a small way to um, better accounting for and engaging with young people's experiences of conflict and of, of violence. So as I said, there's a range of people working in this space and, you know, making arguments for young, recognising young people's capacity to, to, to be agents of, of, of change in, in these kinds of spaces. Because I think really if we're not accounting for young people and young people's involvement in, in in these uh, environments, then we're simply not getting a full picture of a community's ability to respond to, to conflict, respond to insecurity, and so we're missing out on opportunities for how we can better both theorise it, but also respond in practical ways uh, to, to um, these situations of violence to, to better build peace. Of course. Now, a tricky question, will there be a sequel to this book? Can you tell me a little bit about what you're working on now? Absolutely, so my work is still very much focused on young people and, and as I said, recognising young people's agency. I do hope to get back to, to Columbia soon because it holds a, a special place in my heart. Um, my work at the moment is um, looking at the UN Security Council uh, resolution that was passed in 2015, talking about youth peace and security that recognise young people as, as uh, contributors to, to um, peace building and um, trying to account for the advocacy that youth-led organisations were involved in, in in getting to that point, as well as looking at the, the impact of that agenda on um, local, local communities in a range of, of environments. So we'll see how that goes. Well, it sounds very interesting. I look forward to reading it. Thank you so much for your time. Helen. Thank you for having me. Okay.